Right. Well, I, I would like to um, thank by starting the organizers for um, the very kind invitation and also for being so, so flexible when I sadly got COVID and wasn't able to attend in person. And I'd also like to thank um, Alan Dow for graciously um, changing the time of his talk so I could um, give this talk at a time that's morning rather than the middle of the night in Pittsburgh. Anyway, um, with those preliminaries behind me, um, so it's going to be, be a short talk about some joint work uh, with Arthur Apter, part of a forthcoming paper. So it's about um, pathological measures. Maybe pathological is a little harsh. These are just interesting and weird inhabitants of the space of normal measures on a measurable cardinal. So let me start with some things that are kind of, you know, very, very familiar to people who care about large cardinal theory that, you know, going all the way back to Dana Scott, there are limits on the resemblance that the ultra power um, of um, V by a normal measure on a measurable cardinal can have with V. And we can, in particular, note two of them. We can say, you know, for, for many reasons, you know, one can argue that U is not a member of its own ultra power. And so, of course, you know, by Scott's work, you know that you have agreement at level kappa plus one, but you have a failure of agreement at level kappa plus two. And then, um, you know, the most economical proof I know of this fact is that the, the second fact, um, the ultra power map is continuous at kappa plus. And of course, J of kappa plus looks rather like a large-ish regular cardinal on the J side. So the ultra power can't see the pointwise image of kappa plus, which is co-final in J of kappa plus. And so that tells you that um, once you start asking for kappa plus sequences from the image of kappa plus, um, then you do not see all of them. Okay, so now here's a kind of the first version of a general question that if you have a normal measure, how close can you get to these behaviors that are ruled out by Scott's results? And, <clears throat> and of course, you know, and this stuff is again, you know, important, I guess, in the early history of large cardinal theory is um, the first band says, you can't witness that kappa is kappa plus two strong by way of a single normal measure and you can't come even that close to witnessing that kappa is kappa plus super compact by way of a normal measure. And of course, you know, in the history of large cardinal theory and kind of reversing the historical order, you know, the first consideration gives rise to the theory of extenders and the second consideration gives rise to the theory of normal measures on P kappa lambda exactly to have descriptions of embeddings which do have some degree of strength or do have some degree of super compactness. Okay, so here are some consistency results um, from a while ago. So Hugh Wooden proved and um, the ideas of Wooden's proof are gonna come back in, um, in this talk at a certain point. Um, so it is consistent that you have a measurable cardinal kappa with a normal measure u. GCH is going to fail at kappa, so two to the kappa is going to be kappa double plus. And you can get, <coughs> you know, you can get as much kappa plus super compactness as a normal measure could possibly witness in the sense that the ultra power by the normal measure u can actually have all the kappa plus sequences to J of kappa. And then um, answering, I think, a question that, that was raised by John Steele. I proved it. It's a long time ago now that um, you can have a similar phenomenon kind of in the setting of strong embeddings rather than super compact embeddings. <coughs> so again, you can have a normal measure u on a measurable cardinal kappa 
again, two to the kappa is kappa double plus. And um, as is often the case with discussions of strong type embeddings, when you don't have GCH, the convenient way to say the resemblance between um, uh, the resemblance between V and the ultra power in this setting isn't to talk about ranks because that's a mess, but to talk about power sets. It would probably be even better to just give up on the V hierarchy and use the H hierarchy. So probably the most useful way of saying the conclusion would have been H sub kappa double plus is contained in alt V U. And um, the second one's an equiconsistency. So using a little bit of old school in a model theory, um, it was possible to show that, um, you know, you assume that there's no inner model for a strong cardinal, and then you argue that if kappa has one of these weird measures, then there's actually a kappa double plus extender, if that's a word, at kappa in the core model, so that kappa is kappa plus too strong in the core model. Okay, so, and I, I want to bring out a resemblance between the first one and the second one by kind of writing the second one in the same language as the first one. So the second one, you know, in yes, another language is saying all functions from kappa plus to kappa plus are in old VU. So if you don't care about consistency strength, then the first result already gives you the second result consistency-wise. All right, so it's reasonable to ask about um, uh, why you need a failure of GCH. And you, and you do need a failure of GCH to get this um, kind of thing. The point being that, you know, as I mentioned at the start of this talk, a measure, a normal measure, can't be in its own ultra power. And the point would be that, so if you have GCH, well, then the characteristic function of, a, of your favorite uh, normal measure um, is just a function from kappa plus to two. So um, I'm waving my hands, but anyway, um, too much GCH is fatal to having this kind of result. Okay, so now, again, just reminding, you know, people who care about large cardinals or people who have some passing interest in large cardinals um, of another relevant thing. Um, though it's not actually in, in the end so relevant to this talk, but um, useful thing to know. So there's an ordering on the normal measures on a fixed measurable cardinal kappa where u0 is Mitchell below u1 exactly when u0 is a member of the ultra power by u1. And it's a well-founded strict partial ordering. You can say things about its structure just in ZFC. So in particular, um, a version of kind of smallness, if you like, for a measurable cardinal kappa would be to say it has Mitchell order zero. So that means <laughs> it's minimal, if you just tease it out, it's minimal in the Mitchell ordering. So that means there are no normal measures below it in the Mitchell ordering. If you think about it for a second, that means kappa isn't measurable in the ultra power. So then by Wash's theorem, a measure of order zero is exactly a measure that concentrates on non-measurable cardinals. Okay. And since if you if you have the least measurable cardinal by extreme obviousness, um, all measures on the least measurable cardinal are gonna um, concentrate on non-measurables because that's all there is. <coughs> So if you're down at the least measurable cardinal, you can only have normal measures of order zero. Okay, so now you can ask maybe a, a more refined version of my original question. You can say, um, how close can you get to those bounds that I mentioned at the start of this talk with a measure of order zero? And maybe, you know, um, upping the demand by epsilon how close can you get to a measure on the, with a measure on the least measurable cardinal? Okay, so now, so I'm gonna quote a result. Um, we're kind of getting into 
the general area of so-called identity crises. So here's an identity crisis result. So proved, I believe, by, by Hugh Willen, um, using, I think, reinforcing at least initially. So if you have um, a kappa plus supercompact cardinal kappa, you can get into a situation where once again, two to the kappa is kappa double plus, and the least measurable, <coughs> excuse me, the least measurable cardinal kappa actually has a little bit of supercompactness, namely kappa plus supercompactness. Um, for any purists, I'm stating these results in a hand wavy way. So probably I should have stated my hypothesis as GCH and there exists kappa, which is kappa plus supercompact, and then to get the conclusion. All right. So um, once again, what is the role of the failure of um, GCH in this kind of thing? Well, it's very much the sort of same kind of thing I was saying vis-a-vis -vis those, those other results a couple of slides ago, is that um, if two to the kappa is kappa plus, then kappa plus supercompactness is two to the kappa supercompactness. And if you've ever spent much time with supercompact cardinals, you'll know that the reflection power of supercompactness kicks into a higher gear when you get up to two to the kappa supercompactness. So in particular, you know, if kappa is two to the kappa supercompact, you've got an embedding witnessing that then any normal measure on kappa by the closure of the target model is going to be in the target model. And so, in fact, a, if kappa is two to the kappa supercompact, it's, it's actually got to have high initial order. So, in fact, that's, um, uh, that's why you, this, this kind of thing is only, you know, is only relevant when you have a failure of GCH. Okay, now I can state the theorem or the, the easiest version of the theorem because I'm, um, I'm giving only a short talk and therefore I'm only going to give um, the easiest version of the theorem. So in more general versions of this kind of thing, um, you could get... Um, you could get bigger failure of GCH and um, more closure. Um, you could get um, more supercompactness by varying the hypotheses and conclusion appropriately. And because of the method of proof of this one, you can get this kind of thing to happen at many measurable cardinals. Anyway, so I'm, I'm just gonna state, state the easiest one. So the easiest one just says that, again, um, stating the hypothesis a bit loosely, you can actually have one of these funny measures and it can actually exist at the least measurable cardinal. Okay, so the, um, uh, the proof is gonna use a construction by Arthur Apter and Saharan Shala, um, which comes from quite a large body of work by them on identity crises and related matters. And <coughs> the idea is gonna be that uh, you can gently destroy, or I think I use the kind of word efface here, but I'm gonna say kill or destroy in this sort. Uh, you can gently destroy the measurability of a cardinal and since we're interested in failures of GCH, it's going to be destroying the measurability at the same time as blowing up the power set. So the idea is <coughs> that if you have a, um, a suitably prepared measurable cardinal, so it's going to have to be suitably prepared in some, some laborish kind of way, but if you have a suitably prepared cardinal, then you can take away its measurability in this mild way. And then by doing another mild forcing, you can bring the measurability back. So again, I think it won't be a surprise to anyone in this audience that there are <coughs> many, many, many ways of um, destroying the measurability of a measurable cardinal kappa. So 
you know, if you really want it gone for good, then you can do prick reforcing. Then you've changed its co-finality to omega and it's not coming back. Or you can, you know, on various co-finalities or inside various stationary sets, you could add a non-reflecting stationary set. That is, again, going to kill its measurability. And you might have the possibility of bringing it back by destroying the stationary set. But that's that's not what we're doing here. We're, we're doing something different, which and I like to, I don't know how much time I'm going to have to get into the details, but I, I like to give some details. So I'm going to give some details if I can. So, okay, now we're getting kind of into the weeds. So I'm going to have an inaccessible cardinal delta, and I'm going to have GCH at and above delta. And then there are going to be various posets floating around. So P0 is in the ground model, and P0 is going to be adding a non-reflecting stationary set in delta double plus. Okay, and it's important for our purposes that <coughs> when you do this, this is a, a very nicely distributive poset. I guess it's got some strategic closure. So we're not adding any bounded subsets of delta double plus with P when we do P0. Okay, uh, I didn't put my pauses in the right place. Sorry about that. So, um, so there's too much information here. Um, so in the universe, I'm calling it VS, the universe where you forced with P0, there is a certain weak-ish but useful guessing principle on the non-reflecting stationary set S. Namely, there is a club sequence. So a club sequence, um, I should have said, you might as well, for our purposes, assume that X delta has order type omega. So at each delta in S, you have an unbounded set X delta. You can take it to have order type omega. And then whenever you have an unbounded set in delta double plus, you're going to guess it in the sense of getting inside it at stationarily many points. All right. Now, P2 is going to be the forcing for destroying the stationarity of S. Okay, so um, once you've, and once P2 is also not going to add any banded subsets of delta double plus. And now in V of S star C, where you've actually killed the stationarity of S, by some standard combinatorics, I um, because S is non-reflecting and non-stationary, you can just inductively choose disjoint tails of the X deltas. Okay, another standard fact, I guess using a supersum of GCH, that P0 star P2 is a very simple forcing. It just amounts to adding a single Cohen subset of delta double plus. Okay, P1 is actually a complex forcing using the club sequence that I just mentioned as a parameter in its definition. And it's going to add delta double plus many subsets of delta. So in particular, this is going to be where GCH gets killed in this construction at delta is by P1 adding these many subsets of delta. And then the key point is that if you just do P0 to get S and the club sequence, and then you do P1, then what you get is a model in which, <coughs> you know, regardless, regardless of whether delta was measurable or not in the ground model, delta is not measurable in the extension. So I'm not going to say very much about what conditions in P1 are like. I'm just going to say that the club um, property, the, the guessing property for the sequence that lives on S is critical in showing a failure of measurability. And I guess I'm also going to say that these generic sets, um, these RIs, are, you know, not surprisingly, they're going to be added in a kind of generically wild way. And that's going to be ultimately responsible for why delta isn't measurable. Because what's going to happen is you're going to be able to construct a condition which decides whether some number of them um, are measure zero or measure one. 
and then you're going to be able to extend to mess up the proposal at the intersection of the you know the measure one sets and the confluence of the measure zero sets um is actually measure one all right so now the 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 really key point is um I said p1 actually lives in vs and forcing with p1 over vs is kind of destructive forcing but if you add this club set c which remember destroys the stationarity of s then p1 starts looking much different in fact p1 can be reorganized to see that it's equivalent to adding delta double plus many subsets of delta and how is that happening i'm just going to wave my hands and say that the the fact that once s is non-stationary you have these y deltas which are pairwise disjoint n segments of the x deltas radically changes the character of the forcing p1 okay so we're getting close to the end which is good because i'm running out of time all right so you know tldr p0 star p1 is kind of destructive forcing which guarantees that delta is not measurable and also usefully forces gch fails at delta well p0 star p1 star p2 you know when the dust settles it's equivalent to rather rather a pleasant forcing just a product of cohen forcings adding a single cohen subset of delta double plus and delta double plus subsets of delta all right so now in, in my last few minutes I'm just going to take you through the construction so we're going to start off with GCH and kappa kappa plus super compact <coughs> and it's tempting to call my super compactness measure U or V both of those would be a mistake I'm going to call it W okay now we're getting further into the weeds I'm going to look at the super compactness embedding which is the ultra power map by W and I'm going to do some counting arguments which are very elementary but tedious so I've got an embedding witnessing kappa plus super compactness I've got GCH so when the dust settles you will see <coughs> that the images of three cardinals we care about a lot kappa kappa plus and kappa double plus all sit between kappa double plus and kappa triple plus and also p kappa kappa plus is a set of size kappa plus so actually j is continuous at kappa double plus and that's going to be crucial in the end game um yeah by the way j of kappa triple plus is actually kappa triple plus but that, that's that's irrelevant here all right so now it's going to be an eastern iteration where um at inaccessibles below kappa I'm going to force with p0 star p1 but at kappa I'm going to force with p0 star p1 star p2 okay and then for my convenience when I look at the generic object I'm going to use the fact that p0 star p1 star p2 can be rearranged so I'm going to say the generic object for my iteration in the usual convention g kappa is just everything up to kappa and then at the top I just have a product of um two Cohen generics okay so one can argue I mean it's definitely fatal to the measurable cardinals from the ground model but you can also argue and it's easy because this is an eastern iteration I didn't create any new measurable cardinals in the course of this all right so now okay and you know um the phrase lift j onto vj vg kappa plus one is doing a lot of work on this slide so I'm just I'm just going to tell you where the, where the wheels hit the road but um standard arguments are going to let us lift j but we have um a couple of extra demands well one extra demand in particular so as usual I've got to choose a generic you know I, I did forcing a kappa on the v side I need to choose generics compatibly up at j of kappa on the j side 
G0 is no trouble because it's highly distributive. It's distributive over the cardinality of P kappa kappa plus. But G1 is a bit delicate um, because I've only got kappa plus supercompactness. So I can't do a silver style master condition argument. I've got two usual demands. You know, I've got the demand of genericity. I've got the demand of compatibility with you know, the generic G1 at Kappa on the V side. And then this third one, um, this is um, the key idea of that, that theorem by Wooden that I mentioned um, many slides ago. Um, the key point is J of Kappa has cardinality Kappa double plus. And um, G1 is adding kappa double plus many Cohen generic functions from kappa to kappa. And I have the flexibility to make sure that um, when I lift the embedding, for each alpha less than J of kappa, there is a Cohen generic function F beta, such that J of F beta of kappa is alpha. Okay, I'd hooked up my tablet to draw a pretty picture that would show you how to do this. So it's kind of, it's kind of a bit like computability at the theory at this point. I've got to meet dense sets. I've got to ensure compatibility with the um, with the V generic, and I've got to enforce this third condition. Um, this is all possible by carefully building a decreasing kappa double plus sequence of conditions and organizing things so you take care of these things in the right order. So I would have to think about how to say that. Um, but the, the key point is there's no static between the second bullet and the third bullet. So if you think about silver type arguments, you think about the shape of the weakest master condition, then you can make the Cohen function make the images of the Cohen functions take kappa any way you like. All right, so now we have a lifting. So actually kappa is still kappa plus supercompact. That's easy-ish. Um, okay, now we reach the critical stage. And the critical stage is we are going to take this embedding and we are going to factor through the ultra power by a normal measure u. So going all, all the way back to going to the start of large cardinal theory. So we have factored Ju, or say we factored J as the composition of Ju, which is just the ultra power by a normal measure, followed by this K. All right. And <clears throat> I want to underline J is rather different from Ju because Ju has got to be continuous at kappa plus, but J by God is a kappa plus supercompactness embedding. So it's surely discontinuous at kappa plus. All right. So now we're in the end game because this, this is the key argument of, of Wooden. I made the critical point of K surprisingly high because, you know, if you think about what is the image of K, the image of K is everything of the form J of F of kappa. And I made sure that the image of K contains everything less than J of kappa. But of course, by commutativity, it also contains J of kappa. So the critical point of K is really high. And then just a short argument gives us, um, since N is actually closed under kappa plus sequences, we still have the closure that we like for N zero. Okay, so I have used up all my time. So I'm gonna stop.